All right, guys, we're going live. Ready? Yes. <laughs> Three, two. <laughs> that was a cute. That was a cute smile, Roseanne. I bet they caught that on the camera. Uh, smiling Hi. at the grandbaby. That was fun. <laughs> I was gonna have uh, only my boots on for me. Just have my feet, you know. Oh, oh yeah. On, on the side of the camera, but, but then I thought, well. I thought that'd be funny, funny, but then I thought, I thought, well, I better show my face. Well, you know what? I like is, that uh, y'all got a good pair of boots on. I, I like your boot collection. It's very cool. I, li I like your car yeah, collection are... too. It's very cool. <laughs> you like my you like my bike? I do. Oh my god, I love it. You know, is that a? Swing? It's an actual. It's an actual fifty-seven um, Firestone Super Cruiser. So that was like the bike. Oh. It's 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 an original. Uh, it's got just a couple of parts that are remanufactured. Uh, I think the front springs up here, and then uh, the springs under the seat. But uh, the rest of it's it, all the it original. Is it a uh, Well, it's called a Firestone, and uh, in oh. fact, uh, he had it all uh, painted back at the factory, and uh, oh, that was like paint, fifteen, yeah. twenty years ago. So it's like you know and it's been maintained ever since so it's actually a very very rare bike and uh, uh very fun I love in fact those that's pinstripes the th it's like two oh, well, yeah. i guess it's two different well two or three sizes gorgeous um it's it's actually a fun segue into the show we want to do today um you know the call the movie was this trek across yeah. america um uh, going back to Washington, D.C., and uh, when President Trump had uh, asked the American people to come be present uh, when the uh, vote uh, was, was uh, the Electoral College was done there at uh, Congress on January 6th. And uh, um, I what was actually the hell on my... happened? I mean, I saw the call. Yeah. I, I thought it was good. It was a good movie with a good message showing good people uh, trying to be there for other good people in a good cause um, well, in the country. But what in the hell went on on what the hell's going on with the whole, I mean, what is going on? What happened that day? It well, we weren't, the, the American people did not show up to do violence uh in fact that's what the call shows is the people right. that were present that day and uh they were there to be counted but they weren't there to do violence that was people doing a false flag and in fact it even the fbi yes the call, and even the fbi right. even the fbi has had to back off on this whole idea that there was some intent for an insurrection i mean you know the people that that we're doing this whole breach of the congressional building, uh, false flag actors. I've talked about that uh, several times now and, and uh, to try and misconstrue us as uh, these insurrectionists. They were there, the people were there to be counted. And, uh, you know, as time goes on, that's the way this is gonna be understood and seen, I believe, but- uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, just asking you, why did Trump invite people to come that's what doesn't add up or make any sense to me because well because this he was had something in his mind that didn't end up fitting what happened uh president trump you know this was the vote when congress was going to certify the election there was all this uh question of whether or not the uh vote um was valid uh whether or not there was fraud involved and uh, for all the talk that, you know, um, Arizona, the fraud didn't exist. And right. uh, the count's the same now as it was then. No, 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 the count's the same. The question is, now we move to the next level, which hasn't uh, been released yet, but will here shortly. The forensics, were the ballots that were counted, were all of them legitimate legal ballots? You know, they had ballots that were printed on eight and a half and 11 paper and copy machines. Those were not valid ballots. Uh, right. They have uh, ballots. Well, I which... thought to me, I thought the whole issue was that those machines were not supposed to be accessible to 
uh, the internet because then anyone could log on and change the vote count. And that to me was what the whole thing's about. They said uh, over and over again, Dominion and them, they said, no, these were never uh, hooked up to the internet. So, you know, they've been, it's been proven over and over again, including by their own admission that that was an untrue statement, that they had indeed been hooked up to the internet. So that proves right there that they lied and that there's fraud. So how many times do they have to prove it? And also just this, as far as common sense, which to me is what's being outlawed in our country, is common sense. That is what is being outlawed. It's illegal to have common sense or to work for the common good of the common yeah. people. Yep. But um, to, for people to actually think, think after all the polls they've been doing all this time of right to life and what people's actual opinions on abortion are from the gamut from the far left to the far right, uh, most people of all those groups are against live birth abortion. Most of people in this country. Yeah. So you're telling me that 85% of the voters or 85 million voters rushed out to vote for that, to vote for Biden and that, uh, that right there, that that's, proves that they're, it's fraudulent. I well, mean, did you, you did you see that out? now they've uh, admitted that the test program on the uh, shot, uh, which isn't by the way, it's a uh, mRNA modifier. It's uh, not obtained by any classical uh, definition. But that that test program did include cells from fetuses. Well, obviously, if they're cells from fetuses, they mean from aborted children. So what, what purpose did um, uh, tissue or cell material from aborted fetuses have doing in the test program? And then others have asserted that it's also in the shot that was actually released. Well, that hasn't been stated uh, or proven that I'm aware of yet. But if it was in the test program and then let's say you removed it, then how does the shot you release to the public uh, resemble what was done in the test program. Uh, you, you, whatever the test is, is supposed to be what's the actual end thing that goes out. And of course, we know that uh, it was not approved by the FDA for human use. It's still in the uh, classified as an experimental drug. And then compelling or forcing people to take it is a violation of the Nuremberg Code. Uh, this is going to blow up um, in people's faces uh, that are pushing this uh, and it's not that much further down the road. And of course, anytime you talk blood, what are you talking about? You know, we're at this red October moment and even what you and I were talking about privately, it's, it's, it's like the Red Sea moment for the children of Israel. Uh, this is a, uh, the whole month of October, everything red, red China, red in the economy, red in uh, uh, these uh, military terms. Uh, inflation. Red in the red uh, in the balance books. Red red in the balance books. Uh, so we've got you know a government shutdown was looming. They've extended it. Oh, only maybe till December. You know, one thing that's not even fully understood is, you know, the reporting for this third quarter uh, is due October fifteenth for the corporations, um, government agencies uh, with the inflation, etc. Things go wonky. And that could get narrowed down very dramatically. It's like uh, saying, we're good to go for a couple of months after we start the exodus of Afghanistan. And three days later, uh, China's in there dismantling our plot of spy aircraft. And uh, our people are on the run to get out of the country alive. Um, you know, uh, their timing might not uh, be <laughs> what they claim it is. So, you know, that's, 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 so, that's you and me. So you know. am I crazy? Of course, you'll everyone says yeah you are but am i crazy to think i'm not getting the real truth about are we uh, in a war with china <laughs> are well, we in a war uh, i think that's a, a valid question um you know if there uh, let's go back to the vote the places where this was orchestrated from uh and the people involved uh ultimately the contention is that it was orchestrated out of China. And uh, even the Dominion machines uh, were manufactured in China. So uh, if you attack 
digitally with a fraudulent uh, stolen vote to capture control of a country that is considered an act of war. So if China was involved in digitally twisting and flipping the vote, that's an act of war, then we're at war with China. And uh, because the leadership is then not valid, they're Manchurians. They are under the control of a foreign entity uh, taking the helm uh, over America. And by extension, the world, if America is this uh, premier power in the world, uh, you control America and you control the fate of the world. And that's, uh, and even China, ultimately, do you say China's its own person or is China itself in the grip of and under the control of some supranational body or group like a James Bond movie? And that would, in fact, be my contention. It's, it's far more involved, extensive, complicated than most people care to even begin to acknowledge. Well, are they crazy or uh, conspiracy learns when they say that China is run by one bloodline family? Well, um, really, it's, it's multiple bloodlines there. There's always going to be one that's more powerful than the others. Uh, it's like the royal bloodlines uh, around the world. Uh, you've got 13 royal bloodlines that trace their lineage back to Cain. Uh, and uh, they brag about, boast about privately amongst themselves that they're uh, Cainites, children of Cain. And so the right to rule as Cains or kings of the earth by blood. And uh, that extends into China, extends in, into other places most people don't realize, Japan. All of How those come we never groups, heard that? How come as kids we never heard that there were all these cane in the world. We, we never even heard about them. Well, I mean, it's hidden in plain sight. It's the royal bloodlines. And uh, um, it's not that they're hiding so much as uh, it's hiding in plain sight. You don't understand the magic. You know, have you ever played the I game Spoons? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you play the game Spoons, um, you know, I remember at uh, kids camps, you know, that you'd play the spoons and they'd hand two spoons to you and they would be, you know, crossed, uncrossed, you know, upside down, right side up, all sorts of things. And you'd hand them to the next person. The next person would have to decide, is that crossed or uncrossed? Well, you're looking at the spoons. If they're crossed, you say, well, they're crossed. And they'd say wrong. And you'd be like, well, what did I do wrong? You'd have to hand them the next person. You'd try to set them some way and they'd look at them and they'd say wrong. And, while you're looking at the spoons, the whole sneak of the game, especially for the people that know it, behind the scenes is, are your legs crossed or uncrossed? And so you're looking at the spoons, has nothing to do with the spoons, it's the legs. Oh. And so crossed or uncrossed, and even you could be in on the game, you know, in the game, have your legs crossed, you don't know that that's what they're looking at. And everybody else that knows what's going on is like, uh, you know, looking at you're saying uncrossed where your legs are crossed and you don't even know what you're doing. Um, oh, it's, it's you mean, captured it's operation like that's, thing. A, that's a trick, pulling a trick on tricking. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a trick. And then once you know the trick, crossed or uncrossed, it's all about the legs, uh, not the spoons. Uh, the spoons are just a distraction. And so that's this royal thing. You're looking at uh, all the high profiles and everything else. Has nothing to do it. Who's the who's the purest blood back to Cain? That's the the whole royal uh, trick, and that's why uh, I talk about it in the book and uh, in uh, Kid by the Side of the Road. Uh, you know, that's that's some of the stuff with the royal lineage and like that. So, um, you know, but not to get too distracted with that right this minute. But you why know, do they think wanted... it's so cool to be? Uh descendants of Cain they think it's cool to be a murderer well they view Cain differently than everybody else they believe well that, obviously uh, they still believe in the Bible right where they're getting the reference of Cain well they you know it's a historical document you know to these occultists these people mm -hmm. with their religion hidden in plain sight they believe that Cain was the child of Lucifer 
and that the sin in the garden was that Lucifer had sex with Eve, that Eve wasn't raped, that Eve was beguiled and had sex with uh, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, and that she then went and taught Adam the trick. And so she became pregnant by two different fathers during the same birth cycle. And she had twins, children born in the same birth cycle, but of two different fathers, Cain and Abel. That's why Cain is not listed as a child of Adam. Cain is, is, is excluded from the Adamic family because he wasn't uh, fathered by Adam. The mother was Eve in both children's case, but not the father. And so they believe that uh, Cain, being a child of, of Lucifer, Satan, the devil, Samael, uh, he goes by a thousand names, that being a child of, of uh, Lucifer, that they aren't just mere human. They're more than human. They don't look at themselves as being less than human. They look at themselves as being more than human. You want to say space aliens or something like that. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people are looking for the aliens, uh, the reptilians that have landed on Earth. The reptilians is just code, just like spoons. It's just code for children of Lucifer from the Cain side of the family, that they're royals. They're the royal bloodlines. And so they count Lucifer as their father. And that's why there's these Baal worshipers, these Moloch worshipers, and they believe that they're children of the fallen angel at Mount so Hermon. So that allows them to do the things they do. Well, because uh, they believe that they're more than human, that we're here to be farmed, that, right. that we're there, you know, they are farming us and uh, they look at us like food, literally. Yeah. So it's it's a very um so they they do glorify being a murderer then. Well, they don't look at it as as murder in the same sense as we do. They look at it as though they are farming us and yeah. we're food to them and uh yeah. uh as the devil himself does, uh yeah. a means to an end. And uh once you kind of understand their mentality, it's a lot easier to understand their actions. Um Belief, uh, I've said this in, in articles that I've done over the last several decades at different times, and you'll find it in some of the articles I do under other people's names. Belief is the driver of action. Um, what you believe determines what you do and how you do it. So That's belief, the locos. That's the, mm -hmm. the uh, locomotive of the whole train is the belief. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful way of saying it. Um, so, but here we are. Let me just, let me just dive into this. I don't want to, I don't want to yeah. you know, lose too many Please. people on this. Let me just dive into this. You know, we talked about this Red Sea moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, red October. Mm -hmm. Everything going red at the same time. I was talking with Jim Caviezel the other day and, and uh, sure. uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, well, is that like when the gauges on your car start going red the oil temperature gauge goes up the water temperature gauge goes up the transmission temperature gauge goes up you know something broke something's not working right and uh, it's overheating and you don't got long before something's gonna blow and uh, uh, so all the gauges are going red that's red October everything that can start going off the rails and go wrong is is this red October moment uh, you know the economy Red China, you know, the uh, um, Australian uh, defense minister said that war with China at this point cannot be ruled out. And that was just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's becoming more dire by the minute. And, uh, uh, you know, I think we'll see some Band-Aids here and there, but it's not uh, actually going to wind down. It's going to get far worse. And, you know, Israel... Uh, with your background, your history, and that's why I wanted to talk with you about it. Uh, you know, the whole history of Israel, um, as they left Egypt, you know, you had these five plagues, uh, 10 plagues uh, that, that happened to uh, get the people freed out of bondage in um, Egypt. And they were oppressed. It was to make it so bad that the people would want to leave it. They well, because they it. didn't want to, they, they, they were comfortable in their slavery uh, yeah, they as hard it. as it was. 
and they didn't it was what they knew mm -hmm. so to go do something different they didn't want to leave and mm -hmm. so uh the egyptians didn't want to let them go and they frankly didn't want to leave their slavery no they so, didn't. they were comfortable but it was what they knew they they had to be almost driven from the slavery and then when they did get free uh they get out to the red sea and of all the miracles that were done to that point for uh the nation of israel the great one at that point uh was the red sea when they were there at the red sea and the sea was parted and they passed through on the dry ground but everything that led up to that um till that moment you think of these great incredible miracles and uh, the greatest of them up to that point in time you know uh, was the red sea and of course that's this this moment that america's in you know we talked uh, uh actually now almost two years ago we did an interview talking about this election and right. the period of the election being like the book of esther you remember that yeah i do and yes, in that Esther uh, discourse that we did, we talked about the flip. There's two parts to the flip in Esther. There's the part where um, Esther has this uh, big party feast, and it's two nights in a row because one wasn't enough, where she brings in King Xerxes. And uh, then at the very end of the second night, she explains to him that she's under a penalty of death, that uh there's this mandate that's gone out that uh, uh, on a certain day out in the future that all Jews have to be killed and she's a Jew and so is Mordecai. And here the king had been partying with Mordecai and Esther two days in a row over at Harem Girl House. And uh, the other person that was present was Haman. And so they're all drinking and partying, they're best buddies, Haman's yucking it up, slapping Mordecai on the back and, and you know, just being the greatest guy. And then uh, come to find out that uh, Haman has it in for Mordecai, has had a hangman's machine built out in the backyard, which was uh, different than we hang people today. It wasn't a gallows in the sense we have today. It was a spear a very long spear and it was set in the rectum and then the person was hoisted up in the air very high they could see over the walls of the city and all around and that was planned for mordecai and when the king found out what had happened and then found out about this device and we talked about it in our show uh and he came back in he's all drunk hearing all this he's trying to sober himself up he comes in off the patio and he sees Haman hanging on Esther's garments, pleading with her for her to not tell the king anymore. Or to, it costs his life. You know, you know what a mm -hmm. hothead he is and how he can go off on a, on a moment's notice. The king sees him hanging off her robes, is totally lit up instantaneously, exactly what Haman was concerned about. He's a bit of a hothead and he's a drunk. And he orders the guards to take him and go hang him on the hangman's device outside that he had built for for mordecai and he ends up being hung on this device of his own making it's like in proverbs it says he who digs a pit for his neighbor will himself fall into it and so Why isn't that the truth the Haman died by a device of his own making that he had intended for the other guy and that's actually the part of the story that most people don't understand from the Red Sea moment. Most people have never considered what the Red Sea was really all about. And that's what I wanted to kind of share with your folks today. See, we have this Red October, and most of the people listening to us, Roseanne, are of the opinion that all this red, all this danger, 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 Will Robinson, uh, this is the end. It's 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 all over. We've been painted into a corner. It is intended for us. You know, uh, that's not that's not what the story really uh, ends up telling us. Um, see, when Moses uh, brought the people out there to the Red Sea, it wasn't fully just Moses that brought them there. They had uh, this incredible miracle that happened um, after 
the last plague on Egypt. You remember what the last plague was? The firstborn of all of Egypt died when the angel of death passed over the city. And the Israelites were spared because they were told to put the blood of a lamb um, on the lintel and the doorposts, uh, which is the top and the sides of the door to every house uh, in the uh, uh, land of their, of their uh, uh, tribes of Israel. And so the death angel, when it saw the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel, passed over that home and went on to the next one to the next one. And so all those that didn't have the blood of the lamb, which is symbolic of Christ and the sacrifice to come, uh, the death angel would take the firstborn of the household. And so all across Egypt, there was mourning and wailing from the youngest to the oldest, grandparents, children, teenagers, whoever the firstborn was, was gone. And you know, God says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Uh, there's justice and there's vengeance. God doesn't call on us to do vengeance. He does vengeance. And the vengeance there was in part due to the fact that the very beginning of Moses' whole journey in this world was that uh, Pharaoh, at the time that Moses was to be born, had decreed that these children, uh, the, the, that the Jews, the, at that time they were called the uh, Israelites, they were the slaves, they were the, the sons and daughters, children of Israel. Uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were these forefathers, and Jacob, in this journey that he was taking around the, the land, um, uh, in this pilgrimage, he turned to God and had a um, salvation moment, if you will. And God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And then the nation of Israel are called Israelites with this new name that God gave to Jacob um, as a child of promise. And so the Israelites, the children of Jacob, had become extremely numerous in the land of Egypt. Well, the early, early history also has to include in Egypt, how did they get there? They had this brother. Uh, Jacob had 12 sons. And the youngest son, Joseph, um, he uh, had a dream when he was little. And in this dream, he saw himself ruling over the rest of the brothers. And the brothers got jealous. They got mad. In fact, I, I refer to it in the movie The Called. Uh, who is this dreamer? Uh, let us uh, cast him in a pit and we'll throw some blood on his cloak and, and pretend that he was killed by wild animals and uh, take it back to our father and be done with this dreamer who thinks he's going to rule over us. And then they sold Joseph to a caravan. They didn't want the blood of Joseph, their brother, on their hands. So instead of killing him, they sell him for money. Kind of like Judas and his 30 pieces of silver. They sell their brother for money to a caravan that's traveling by, that's headed for Egypt. And Joseph becomes a slave in Egypt by his own brother's hand. And they take his coat of many colors, which was indicative of ruling. And by the way, each of the tribes of Israel, as you know, has a different jewel that right. uh, denotes them. And they're on the priest's garments, etc. Right. Well, that coat of many colors has the colors of right. each of the tribes, yeah. each of the sons of, of Jacob right. he in was, that he coat was, of many colors. He was a, he was a big multi-tribal priest. And so he had that coat of many colors. They splatter this blood from a beast on it, say that it's uh, Joseph's, and take it back to Jacob, their dad, Israel. And he's in horrible pain and, and mourning because his favored son, the youngest, has been killed by animals. And so it, it disturbs him the rest of his life, obviously. And he's already a pretty old guy at that point in time. 
Um, all this time, while he thinks that Joseph is dead, the brothers are done with him, and he's gone. Joseph finds himself in Egypt as a slave. And mm -hmm. uh, there he has a couple of dreams uh, as a result of the ability to have dreams. And there's all sorts of dramas you can go read. He got accused of trying to rape, you know, uh, Potiphar's wife and she was setting him up and got mad because it was uh, uh, he you know as a slave didn't want to go against his master and uh, so she set him up and had him sent to prison uh, a lot of bizarre stuff and so then here Pharaoh finds him or Joseph finds himself in prison and Pharaoh has a dream and one of the prisoners remembers that Joseph can read dreams interpret them they call Joseph up, he interprets the dream, and it's the dream where there's uh, seven fat cows and seven skinny ones, and seven fat ears of corn and seven skinny ones. And all the priests of Pharaoh can't figure out the dream. And he's got them under a threat of death if they don't figure it out. And uh, they don't just have to tell him what the interpretation of the dream is, Pharaoh tells him, well, you got to tell me what the dream was first and then give me the interpretation or I won't believe your interpretation because you'll just make something up. So the trick is that if you tell me that it's the dream I had and you're wrong, I'm going to have you killed that way. So now all the priests are under this threat of death if they don't come up with somebody that can figure out what Pharaoh's dream was and then what the interpretation of it is. And so they're afraid to give a wrong answer. And uh, Pharaoh uh, you know, they find the slave kid down on the bottom of the prison and uh, he's brought up because people said, no, he can interpret it. And he comes up, tells Pharaoh both what his dream was and what the interpretation was. And the interpretation was there were seven fat years coming and then seven lean years. And uh, that uh, that was why there was fat cows and, and heavy corn and thin cows and uh uh, wheat corn or diseased corn. And so uh, Pharaoh, because he knows this person has um, uh, insights that are divine in origin from God himself to have been able to both give the dream and the interpretation and have it be correct, uh, Pharaoh makes Joseph the number two most powerful person in the kingdom under him only. And so Pharaoh, uh, Joseph becomes you know, literally the second most powerful person in the world in that era, because Egypt is this right. unbelievable Mecca at the time. So yeah. uh, Joseph then, you know, presides over storing up the grain, setting aside everything. Then when the famine hits, Jacob's family is starving to death. They take some of their wealth and Jacob sends his sons down to Egypt. They show up and Joseph recognizes them, of course, is probably looking for them because God's given him insight that this is going to happen. And there's all sorts of events happen. Uh, ultimately, Jacob and all of the family move to Egypt under Joseph's protection. And exactly as Joseph had the dream, his brothers, now he rules over them in Egypt. And uh, uh, from that point, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob show up. And the best guess is there was about 66 of them is what people want to use for their account. I think there was 77, but uh, depends on who's writing the book. And they show up there in Egypt. And then from that small number, the 12 sons of jo Jacob mm -hmm. uh, become the nation of Israel, nation of Jacob, whose name was turned to Israel. And then they begin to proliferate in Egypt. And over a 400-year period, they become a very large number estimated 400 years later to be around 2.4 million people, about 600,000 men, about 600,000 women, and two kids each kind of a mentality is, is, is where it's at. Um, you know, different ages, etc. But that's just this kind of this rough estimate. So in that short period, they become the nation of Israel. But because of their number, it was so great that the Pharaoh uh, and his advisors 
are looking at this huge crowd of people and, and they've become enslaved in Egypt under the, um, the crown, if you will, under Pharaoh's control. And uh, they were becoming so numerous that Pharaoh's advisors are going, you know, if they decide they don't want to be slaves anymore, there's so many of them, they could take us out. We need to thin the herd a bit. There's so many of them. Sound familiar, anybody? There is so many of them. We need to cut their numbers radically. And so they go out and uh, decide to do a baby killing. Too many uh, Israelites. We want to kill all the babies. So in this moment when these advisors advise Pharaoh to have all the babies killed, and by the way, no relation to Haman, but Pharaoh's chief advisor at the time is reported, uh, reputed to be named Haman, same as in Esther's day. And uh, so they advise Pharaoh to have all the babies killed, uh, I think two years of age and younger. And Males. in this period, yeah, it was a mass killing. And in this period, uh, Moses's mom, uh, she's pregnant. She tends the women at Pharaoh's court. And so she's, she's a slave girl in Pharaoh's court. Uh, you know, pretty hard to hide that you're pregnant, but she may have hidden it reasonably enough. But knowing that her baby's going to be killed if they think she's had the baby, um, she places the baby, Moses, in a basket made of reeds. And then she sets him adrift in this slow moving part of the sea uh, in the Nile. And he's floating down the sea through the reeds at a very slow pace. She probably set him adrift in the night when nobody could see this. And she's living up river from where Pharaoh's harem girl house is located. This and is another one work. of those. This is another one of those times when we have totally different uh, teachings and understandings about this. But you know, I'm totally cool with you telling. Yeah, well, so yeah, I, I want to hear your side. So she goes down to work, and here comes the basket down the river, nudges Pharaoh's uh, uh, daughter over there. She sees the Egyptian child, uh, or sees the basket, goes out and grabs it, discovers the child, and it knows it's one of the children of the Egyptian women that uh, are under threat of death. And then Moses is saved through the water, this is symbolic of baptism, of a watery death, uh, that uh, baptism is symbolic of, of being born through um, death or drowning, etc. And then uh, in this basket of reeds, and um, he's raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's court to be a Pharaoh, uh, raised side by side with the man who at that time is also a child, who does become Pharaoh. And so the Pharaoh that's chasing him down, uh, going to the Red Sea, was raised as a brother to Moses in Pharaoh's house, in Pharaoh's courts, and knows all the tricks, knows the strategy as a military strategist, an economic strategist. And this family of Jacob, known as Israel, and uh, uh, Joseph, who had preserved Egypt through the famine and uh, made it wealthier than ever. Um, and then the people that had become slaves. So that's kind of a, a synopsis of how we got to this moment where the people are slaves in Israel. But, you know, I want to hear your, your angle on that too. Well, mine's from the Torah, uh, yes. you know, uh, and it was Moses sister, Miriam, who um, was the protagonist of the whole story. So, that I'll tell another time, but it's very deep and uh, a little different from yours. It was she who was uh, Pharaoh's daughter's handmaiden and also her advisor and also like very deep, like best friends with. Because at that time, I guess like now, I know I get really close with my assistants and uh, mm -hmm. you know, they were they were very close. And she is the one who brought Moses to Pharaoh's daughter and... Uh, 
said, I found this baby. She knew, you know, it was her brother. And mm -hmm. uh, she said, I found this baby. And, um, and uh, whatever words, there's a whole bunch of words exchanged and they agree to raise the baby uh, in the, in the uh, family. And that, that's who was Moses' teacher, was his sister. Yes, and, so, and of course you know, that was, she was very close. He doesn't find that out until way later. Mm -hmm. He doesn't find that out till way later. But also, we we learned that the 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 true hidden hero of the whole whole story is Jethro, Yitro, and Torah has a lot to say with, about Yitro and what he taught Moses after Moses retreated from Egypt to uh, get his head straight of what he felt his real contribution to history was going to be. And well, he, and of course, he treated to the common people to soak in some common sense. Right. And Jethro, I agree with you, a tremendous uh, people don't really fully grasp the genius of Jethro um, in uh, Moses's education. Moses, you, you think about it. He was educated in Pharaoh's court, so he knew all of the magician's tricks. Right. Uh, for tricks. example, when he came to uh Egypt with this mission from God to free God's people from slavery and uh, take them to the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, during Abraham's sojourning. Uh, when he came to Egypt and uh, you know Pharaoh's you know challenging him, well who who sent you? And he says, uh, I am sent me uh, because God told me if he asked who sent you tell him that I am. Mm -hmm. I am that I am. Uh, and by the way, the devil wants to be as God. Mm -hmm. So the devil does, he doesn't want to be greater than God because there is nothing, no one right. greater than God. So the devil only aspires to be as great as God. So uh, God says, I am. The devil says, I will that I am. Yeah. As an act of will, will I am. And, right. um, so, you know, that's this challenge to God's uh, supremacy uh, that comes in there. But Moses, you know, what's interesting about Moses, here he is raised in Pharaoh's court with all of the skills to be a Pharaoh mm -hmm. and uh, the same advisors, the same teachers. But he also has this other additional teacher, which is Miriam, and I agree with you on that, and uh, explaining these things to him. And by the way, Moses' mother was brought in as a wet nurse, so he even got nursed by his own real mother. And so in that, in that whole thing, when Moses realizing that he's actually one of the children of Jacob, that he's uh, an Israelite, mm -hmm. um, and they weren't really called Jews at the time, they were Israelites. Right. When he realizes that, and then he sees some of the treatment of the Jews, uh, the Israelites, by these Egyptian taskmasters, uh, one of them so upset him and offended him that he killed him. And that became the basis for having to uh, send Moses into exile. He didn't just go on a you know mild journey, he was forced into exile. Uh, not put to death, but spared because he was raised as a pharaoh, but sent into exile. And, and when he went into exile, um, first he was he was saved, passing through the water in this this boat of reeds, kind of like Noah being saved in a boat through the water at the great flood. There's some symbology there, and all of humanity uh, at the same time, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, this leader that was going to bring them out of slavery, he was slave, saved through water. But then again, when he leaves Egypt to go into exile, uh, a lot of the uh, commentators talk about the fact that his path to North Africa, where he met uh, his wife and his, mm -hmm. you know, the father-in-law Jethro, mm -hmm. um, took him through the reed sea the red sea that at the upper right. end of the sea it's got reeds and marshes and so right. he passed through the sea there sea into reeds, the right. desert and on to 
where he came to the other side where he was thirsty and was at the well and the woman drew water for him who then became his wife. You know, by the way, Jethro and his children were black. Right. So Moses had a black wife. Right. Uh, in fact, Miriam famously, when at one point she was mocking Moses's wife and her advice and everything and mocking the color of her skin, uh, God was not happy with that. And so he says, oh, you like white? You think white's so cool? Okay, well, I'll give you white. And so she was covered with leprosy, which makes your skin very white like a mm -hmm. snowflake. And uh, it took Moses interceding to have her um, that curse removed from her because she had uh, spoken against Moses's wife. So, uh, and of course, that's the basis for the um, extraction of the tribes out of North Africa back to Israel, which are these uh, black people who themselves right. are seen as um, children of Israel. Right. And uh, uh, that's that's this whole segment of the Israeli population a lot That's of people right. don't understand. Yeah. So a large part of the of the population. Well but but so my my point here though, I think the, the one thing where I wanted to kinda uh get your thoughts a bit mm -hmm. see um you have to think about what Egypt was like. It's the greatest metropolis on the planet. Uh it's got the pyramid. The pyramid at that time was completely covered with white marble. And it was of a type of, of limestone, really. It looked like marble in a sense, but polished and had this gold cap on the top uh, purportedly. And uh, the pyramid we see today, all of that covering has been removed. It, it uh, was uh, scavenged. But at that time, that material, that limestone, it would gather sunlight during the day and at night, it would glow like a nightlight. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, you know, you could see it, you know, at great, great distances. It was this incredible, um, you know, uh, feat of, of building. Uh, the mechanics of the Great Pyramid are just uh, astonishing. I mean, you know, people are still learning things now all the time about it. Uh, for example, the face of the pyramid, the, the four sides, um, the face is actually concave, like a big satellite dish where it's got a slight curve to it, but the curve is very, very subtle. Each face has exactly the curve that is the curvature of the earth. If you were to take it and turn it on its side, it's got exactly the same tiny, minute curve to it that the surface of the earth does, slightly no concave. Yep, no it's way. very, very subtle. It's, it's, it's amazing. Wow. Uh, in if you measure the pyramid in what we call Jewish inches as opposed to English inches, which is a very slight difference. It's how they, um, you know, whether the inches are held in platinum or gold or silver, etc. And, the, and the, those materials really? expand or contract. Yeah, this that's is it's, hilarious. It's, I love that. Well, if you if you measure the pyramid in Jewish inches, the circumference in inches is an extrapolation of the actual circumference of the earth at 24,000 some odd miles. So it's a, it's a, it's a precise fraction. There's all sorts of uh, amazing math involved in the great pyramid that, that show um, this authorship that's way beyond um, even current understanding today uh, is challenged by all this minutia of, of the precision of the Great Pyramid. But um, Egypt is this incredible place of technology, right. very advanced, very hierarchical in the society, the bloodlines. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Pharaoh is, when we say president in the American system, the president uh, president's the word that we use in English to mean pharaoh. That's one of the interpretations of the term president is oh, pharaoh. Yeah, uh -huh. right. And when you look at all the 
uh, Washington, D.C., and the symbology around Washington, D.C., the whole city is one great religious city. It's an mm -hmm. occult city, but it's yeah. religious. It's as religious as the Vatican. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's all for it's, Pharaoh. And it's all for Pharaoh. It's built around this pharaohic um, premise, uh, Egyptian symbology, etc., all through the area. And so um, the president of Egypt, uh, Pharaoh uh, of Egypt, this ruler, um, he's at the top of the heap. And at one time, Joseph was revered as the as the savior of Egypt, the person that saved them from this incredible famine and kept them going. And uh, Pharaoh, uh, uh, later generations, forgot Joseph's role in saving Egypt. And so here, 400 years later, the children of Israel are considered um, a nuisance because they're growing so fast that they could overrun Egypt. But the interesting thing there, too, is that... Um, why didn't God just let the children of Israel take over Egypt? Why, and if they're that numerous and they're that close, why send them all the way over to Canaan land? Why not just let them uh, take over Egypt? Uh, it's theirs anyway. Joseph saved them. Uh, have a little war right there. You're there already and take over uh, Egypt. In fact, there's a lot of people there within the Jewish uh, Israeli uh, family that were probably contending for that. They didn't want to leave Egypt as slaves. They wanted yeah, to work right. a plan to take control of Egypt, yeah, but that wasn't that God's plan. That was yeah. somebody else's plan. Uh, you know, if, if you think about it, Roseanne, um, when Joseph got to Egypt, he was um, uh one of the things when he brought his family down, Jacob's sons down to Egypt, he had their family history, which was verbal, written mm -hmm. down. And they, the book that is from that, I've talked about it in your show before, is the lost books of Adam and Eve. And so the first right. 50 days after Adam and Eve left the garden is this lost books of Adam and Eve that, that Joseph had written down. That's the memory that Egypt had recorded about uh, Adam and Eve and how they came out of the garden. And then the other thing that Joseph did that's not seen now uh, anywhere, but it's purported that he also recorded the wanderings of Abraham. And uh, that was passed on, including verbally, uh, you know, we see it in the uh, books of Moses, uh, Petuchin, and that is where um, the wanderings of Abraham, who was called by God to leave Chaldea, where they were heavily into, you know, occult readings and future uh, predictions and stuff like that. Um, Abraham was sent into this far off land, which was becoming Canaan land and everywhere that Abraham set the sole of his foot was to be given to his children. And this is right. when Abraham was childless. And so he had this belief, this dream that he was going to be the father of nations, even though he hadn't even had one kid. And he went through travel to this whole land that became the nation of Israel, uh, where the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, when Abraham did finally have his child of promise, which was Isaac, uh, when he and Sarah were extremely old, beyond the age of having children, she became pregnant, has this child, Isaac, and uh, Isaac then has the child, Jacob, and that became um, the father of nations, uh, uh, just as was promised to Abraham, his grandfather. And so when, when Joseph had the whole family there in Egypt, he recorded this family history. And he says, okay, someday we're going back where our great-grandfather wandered the land of Canaan. And we're going to possess that land. It's our gift from God. And when you go, when this happens, when this people become a nation, 
uh, because Joseph actually, he saw dreams. He had dreams of the future, kind of like Daniel did later. He would see things. Yeah. Joseph saw what would happen out in the future. Yeah, he had and sight. He, he was a seer. He he was a seer. In fact, if you remember when, when the cup was supposedly mm -hmm. stolen and they sent and had Benjamin kept as the child uh, uh, right. uh, that, that forced him to come back uh, uh, when they came for grain, Joseph set him up to make their father come back to uh, Egypt. Um, it was Joseph's cup that was a fortune-telling cup. Right. that was supposedly stolen from Joseph and was actually hidden in the backpack of Benjamin. And so then uh, they, uh, uh, that was because he was a seer. He could see things. That's why he was, you know, called up into Pharaoh's court. He could read the dreams. Joseph saw the future, remembered the family history about Abraham, saw the future, saw a day when the people would leave Egypt and go to where God had, had always intended them to go not to take over Egypt and own Egypt uh, going from slave to master but going to a land that God had already promised to him and he tells them and when you go you got to take my bones so all these pharaohs yeah. wanted their bones buried and you know preserved mm -hmm. and mummified and everything else but Joseph wasn't while he was in Egypt, he didn't actually become an Egyptian. He still counted his tribe, his history, mm -hmm. right. as a child of Abraham. Even though he'd gone into slavery, he intended and saw the future and wanted even his bones to be taken from this land of the occult, land right. of slavery, to go to the land where the children would be free and grow right. and do what God had intended for them. And well, so when the Israelites it simple left, like that, it's simple like that. It's like the occult is slavery, you know, period. And, uh, you know, freedom is, uh, you know, a, a belief in uh, our connection to God only. It isn't a connection to, uh, a, uh, a feudal system on earth. Well, um, if you're in slavery, are you uh, beholden to God in heaven or are you under the thumb of some man, uh, some created being? If you're in the control of Satan himself, are you in the control of God or are you in the control of some other entity at the whim and the will? Uh, are you steered away from God's uh, intended uh, direction for your life? Yeah, and, you're, you're uh, under the you're under the command and control of some BS political system on Earth that has money in it. Well, where is your life energy going? You know, in, here in America right now, if you work your nine to five job you know, six or seven days a week anymore. Um, and your wife and kids all do the same. Their labors are converted to dollars. Yeah, and then, then you can take your dollars and go out and buy things you need to live. But after a piece is taken out in the taxes, and by the way, what, go look at any dollar bill, any $5, $10, $20, $50, $100 bill, every last one of them. What's all through that currency? It's the um, images, the imprints, the brands of the occult, including yeah, no kidding. Egypt, the pyramids, mm -hmm. the eagles, the pyramid. all the different branding. Yeah. And it's occult branding, the owls, yeah, frogs, everything. All of that branding, why is that on your money? What's that got to do with being an American? It's because... It's part of the brainwashing. Well, it's the branding that you're mm -hmm. a slave. Right. Your energies are turned into their purposes. Right. Your energies are con converted into 
um, uh, you know, something is an intermediary, and then a portion of it's given back. When to you. they say the almighty dollar, they ain't lying. <laughs> That's true. And it's not the God Almighty dollar. It's no. a God, but it's not the God. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things going red here right now is uh, mm -hmm. in the currency markets, by the way, uh, that most people don't see. Um, it's a promise. The paper bill is a promise uh, of return. It's not a guarantee. It has no actual substance other than the promise. Uh, most of the dollars that most people have aren't even paper. They're dots and tittles in a computer program somewhere. Uh, right. And uh, what happens in that kind of currency is eventually it goes down to the value of whatever it's printed on. Well, if it's paper, it might be four or five cents per bill. But if it's oh now God. dots and tittles it's on a computer so screen, it could go down to the value of dots and tittles on a computer screen where it's not even worth the paper it's, it's printed, printed on. on. Okay. So you're a slave. It's like the lies of today aren't even worth the paper they're printed on. Mm -hmm. The lies in the news are not even worth the paper. Well, how about, let me ask you some, well, I don't want to interrupt. I want you to finish. No, no, point. no. I'm, I'm, we're having fun. We're having fun. You know, well, if, anybody who's listening to us, Roseanne, has to be laid back. Look, if you're in a rush to get an answer, get an answer, get an answer, this probably isn't uh, the right people yeah. to be listening to. We're yeah. having a fun conversation. There's a lot yeah. of little dodges and dives here and uh, kind of fun, but you're, you're thinking through how does this apply to us today? And right. some, some things aren't clear. You have to kind of go um, a circuitous route. By the way, Roseanne, you know, the straightest route from Egypt, when the Israelites left Egypt, they knew where they were going. Think about this. Joseph had the dream. He recorded the history. He recorded the family history. And the family history said, you are promised by God through your father, Abraham, that all the land that Abraham sojourned in, camped in, traveled in, Wherever he set the sole of his foot, that was be, to be given to his offspring at some future time. And so by faith, God promised Abraham and he was given what God promised, a nation of children. And so those children, the nation of Israel, what Joseph saw was those children had to go take and possess that land. And mm -hmm. he knew where the land was. He'd recorded the travels of Abraham. And those travels were through this area where the Canaanites had uh, camped out and, and built their cities. And by the way, think of it this way. The devil knows what God's saying. He knew what the family history was for the Jews, for the Israelites. He knew what God had promised Abraham. Where did these Canaanites come from? Cainites, the children of Cain. Where did they come from? All the way back to Cain, this this back to the garden, this brothers, half brothers, mm -hmm. fighting for control of the planet. So the Canaanites, under the unction of the devil himself, Moloch and Baal, who sacrifice required the sacrifice of children to serve them, to feed them. Well, right These, there, that is the definition of slavery. And all of slavery runs with that prerequisite, the sacrifice of children. Yes, yes. Uh, and so the children, uh, the Canaanites go out and they occupy the land that was mm -hmm. promised to Abraham and his seed, mm -hmm. the Israelites. Right. They occupy that. What is that from a satanic perspective, thinking chess 5D? That, the that's devil, imperialism. Well, the devil is blocking God. Mm -hmm. It's a blocking right. move in chess. He puts right. his soldiers out there, his players, his pieces out right. there to block the children of Israel right. from being able to ever get in the land. It's a blocking move. And he, and he includes, yeah. you know, giants, <laughs> you know, big, yes, it you does. Know, big stuff. So when Joseph saw the future, 
and saw where the people were supposed to go. He says, I want you to take my bones with you. But then God, at the end of the plagues and the people leave Egypt, do they head straight for the police that Joseph had, had said going? Do they go straight to the place God showed Moses he was, he was supposed to take people straight to no. uh, Canaan land for the fight? No, what he does, nope. they, they, there's a miracle that occurs as the people are assembling and the Egyptians actually have to pay off the Israelites to leave Egypt, get away from us, leave right. us, take your plagues with you. And so they take all right. of their treasure, all of their weapons. Think about this. They took valuable weapons, swords and knives and shields, and they gave these this weaponry. The children of Israel didn't just leave with gold from those that they had That's served. Right. They had they all left the with wealth weapons. of Egypt. All the wealth of Egypt. And think about this, Roseanne. You and I talked about this previously, and I think you're the one that actually specifically said it to me. That was um, payback, recompense for all the years of slavery. The gold and precious things of Egypt that were bestowed on the children of Israel was what they had earned in the 400 years of slavery. Right. They got, they it's weren't stealing anything. It was reparations. And there'd been a war type condition because they'd killed the children of Israel. Uh, you know, that was how Moses was born in the midst of a massacre. That's right. And was saved through a blood massacre of children. That's right. Through that watery grave and basket and raised in Pharaoh's court. Um, but when God had all the people assembled to leave Egypt, what appeared at that time? A miracle happened that was astonishing. There was a huge cloud, like a pillar by day that went up into the heavens. And everybody, you couldn't miss it, it was like a tornado. Uh, and by night, it was a pillar of fire and uh, a tornado of fire. And it went ahead of the people. And it was like a, you know, a guiding light or something. Go this way. And it was, you know, you also had vipers, you know, snakes uh, in that area. And so this pillar by night, you know, it keep the snakes away, keep the uh, vermin away. So... Uh, this pillar of, of smoke or cloud by day to protect them from the, the heat and this pillar of fire by night uh, providing the warmth and also the light. Uh, and it led the way for the people. But when it went, it didn't go straight towards Canaan land. In fact, what happened, the path between Egypt and Canaan land took you past some huge fortifications that the Egyptians built. Um, these rock fortifications were for defense, and they were at choke points where if an invading army was to come to try and do harm or t take Egypt, these were defensible positions, and they were heavily manned. If the Israelites had gone past those locations, uh, the contention is, is that they could have been, you know, Pharaoh changed his mind, they could have been attacked, they'd be vulnerable. And plus they'd have had to fight with the Philistines to get across their land on their way to Canaan land. And uh, they weren't ready to fight. Even though they had the arms, they didn't have the skill sets. So God, not Moses, God took them a direction with the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night out along the desert road and or deserted road, if you want to put it that way, but this barren desert road and over beside the Red Sea or the Reed Sea and along the edge of the Reed Sea and around all those fortifications, around the uh, Philistines to head towards the land that God had promised Abraham and intended God. It was a long, long way around. And while they were traveling along, uh, getting there, what happens? I was just talking with Jim Caviezel this morning. 
we were talking about, he took this walk, a kind of impromptu with a, a Father Mahana, a friend of both of ours. Um, uh, he, uh, he's the guy that uh, actually did the exorcism of the White House for uh, President Trump and Melania. And they took this sojourning that's called uh, uh, Camino, uh, the Camino. Uh, it's, it's where the word El Camino comes, go trucking with your El Camino, your Chevy truck. The Camino is the walk, it's the journey. And so Jim took this long walk uh, in Spain, uh, uh, 526 miles. <laughs> well, I guess wow. when you walk that far, you know exactly how many miles you went. Yeah. Uh, I say, oh, about 500 miles. He says, no, 520. I says, 520, yeah. you know that exactly? Well, actually, it's 526. <laughs> you know, I guess you uh, would. You'd remember it. Well, God took the nation of Israel the long way around but that mm -hmm. whole time he's getting him in the right men mental state he's training them how to follow his lead and they're well they're a lot of them had to die obstacles. off too well but he in that early stage die off. well in that early stage there they were all strong remember the children of of israel had been in slavery think back to moses at the time that moses was born Besides killing all of the young children, Pharaoh, by his advisors, Haman and others, uh, his advisors said, stop giving them hay. What the, what the Israelites were doing was making bricks. Uh -huh. And so they were provided with straw. And then with the straw, they would make these bricks uh, with straw and clay. They'd fire them up in a kiln and uh that was used for building so they were really the basis for the building there in egypt all their big construction projects so when when pharaoh did this decree to have the kids killed he also said and now force them to also go out and gather their own straw and uh, uh rubble for the bricks themselves don't just provide it to them and in that time period with these extra labors placed on them, which made their days of labor longer, they became stronger. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they weren't weak. They were strong because of all of their labors under these harsh taskmasters. They left Egypt with all these goods, all these possessions, all this armory. They didn't have the training to use it, they didn't have the mentality to use it. They had the basis for wealth. They had the basis for strength. They didn't have the mind or the training to be strong. And this journey on this long path out of Egypt uh, was about getting them to come together and, and work together and think together and all that. Uh, you know, uh, that's what this this journey this walk is all about you know jim was talking about that uh, uh you start out with all these possessions and your backpack uh on this camino run and by the time you get a few days in it you've left all the stuff behind you don't really need because it's heavy you start out with a backpack that was 40 pounds and ends up with a backpack that's 20. <laughs> Yeah, and you stop. You know, you you start casting stuff. Plus, all the weight you lose. He says you start out with a few uh, pretty fluffy. By the time you're done, 526 miles, uh, you're skinny as a rail, and you can't take in too many calories. You can eat like a horse. But uh, that was the route that God was taking the uh, children of uh, Israel on, and that's this moment when we talk Red October that we as a nation are in after all this trial and tribulations of the last year and a half and the dramas and uh, this fight that we're in. And now here we are at this Red Sea moment as a nation, as a world really, observing what's happening here. And you have a lot of, of Americans that are of a mindset that it's all over, we're done. You know, what, what happened was the pillar of fire by night and cloud by day, not Moses, the cloud, led the people around this way and at a certain point along the edge of the red sea 
God told Moses to tell the people, stop and go back. And everybody was like, what? And at this time, it looked like they were lost. They didn't know where they were going. They changed directions. They don't look like they know where they're going. They were going this way, and all of a sudden, now they're going to go this way, and they don't know which way they're going to go. Come on. What, what's going on here? At the same time, Pharaoh had seller's remorse, had uh, buyer's remorse, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. He had allowed the people to leave with all the possessions of Egypt, all this wealth, all this armory and had second thoughts and so his advisors are telling him you know because they you know they had this big death kill off they'd out all these plagues uh you know nile had turned to blood you know a plague of frogs all sorts of things then the firstborn all dead but pharaoh's now all of a sudden he, he was shocked and stunned and pissed off but then he changes his mind no we're not going to do that so after the israelites had traveled all the way around by the edge of the Red Sea, Pharaoh takes the straight route past all of his armaments. He has 600 chariots, which are like light armor, um, mm -hmm. like tanks. And, uh, and their, and their um, uh, chariots and, and the guys running the chariots, which could have a couple people on them, not just one. And then the foot soldiers that are along with them. And they go racing off headed for the Israelites, uh, you know, 600 and some foot soldiers, might be a few thousand, uh, going up against two and a half million. That doesn't sound like very good odds, except the two and a half million, you know, the majority are women and children. And uh, the men aren't even trained for battle, even if they have the armament. And then, then they don't have chariots which are the tanks of the day. Uh, it'd be the equivalent of trying to face someone with a machine gun uh, and you just have a sword. It's not just facing somebody with a gun, it's somebody with a heavy machine gun. You can mow down thousands and thousands uh, and never get close enough in to get a perfect kill shot to take out the chariot and the, and the driver. So what happens is Pharaoh is leading the charge because the people of Egypt are having this remorse over losing all their possessions to the slaves, to the slaves. They can't stand it. They're pissed there, off. This is a really deep subject and we haven't even broached it. We have to have this conversation some other time. Cause I, I, right. have, a, I have a thesis about this whole thing, but we won't well, discuss it this time. Well, we'll we'll hear. I want to hear your side too on this. But uh, let me just add this one little thing. Okay. When Pharaoh gets close to the people, imagine the people. What was interesting was the cloud of pillar, by day and night, had moved ahead of the people to the edge of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Moses had told them to back up. To Pharaoh. And to his people, it looked like they were lost. Because if they just kept continuing the direction they're going, they get to the shallower part of the Red Sea where it is reeds and it, it can be walked across. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't made it that far. They turned back and now they got mountains on one side, the sea on the other. They've backed themselves into a trap. Pharaoh sees that they've made what is militarily strategically a horrible maneuver stupid asinine they backed themselves into a corner and moses who'd been very confident in the way he talked up to that point in time uh moses gets to this moment here and uh he you know all of a sudden it's in it's in uh, uh exodus uh chapter 14 verse 15 and uh, Moses is acting like he doesn't know what, uh, what to do next. In the scriptures, what it says is the people are crying out to Moses after he gets him backed into this corner. And they see the dust cloud of all of Pharaoh's chariots coming at him. And the sea behind him and the mountains to the side. There's no escape. They're about to get mowed down. Because the way these chariots worked, 
the chariots would come in in kind of a circuitous way, like like little turnings. And so they didn't just come right straight into the crowd plowing into it. They would chomp off a piece of the people in these rotating groups. Uh, that's why like in, in uh, Charlton Heston and, you know, uh, in the chariot scene, they're going in this big arena in circles. Um, it was like a chainsaw. They could slice out a group of the people and then they'd come back out and others would come in. Then they'd slice out another group like a chainsaw and they'd cut into them. And the people would have to go back and back and they'd just be mowed down and be going over the dead bodies. And so uh, it was, you know, for people that didn't have chariots, it was almost impossible to defeat these chariot uh, fighters with their strategies. And so they can see death headed their way and that they're going to be mowed down uh, uh, in this in this process, and there's no escape. And and you know the people of, of as slaves, they knew the conquerings of of the Egyptian army. They knew what they were capable of. Uh, they were very afraid of this, and so they're crying out to Moses, you know, Moses, Moses, what were you thinking? You know, Moses is 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 he's not Pharaoh, he's not president. Moses is the sole commander. He's the commander in chief of this people uh they can be an army they are an army they just don't realize it yet and they're crying out to him weren't there enough grave sites in egypt did you have to bring us out here to have us killed you were raised in pharaoh's court as pharaoh's brother you did this to betray us you brought us out here to have us all killed they mm -hmm. accuse Moses of being in collusion with Pharaoh and bringing them out to the edge of the sea to be mowed down. They right. don't even recall that the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night was God that brought them to that point. And mm -hmm. then they're screaming to Moses and Moses in kind of desperation. Here's what the scripture says in 1415 of Exodus says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Here they are backed up against the sea. Right. Moses cries out to God, you know, what do I do now? What do I do now? He like sticks his staff up because his staff, you know, turned into a snake. He's able to declare these things, dips it in the Nile, it turns to blood, etc. His staff was like this secret weapon. So you can see Moses out there waving his staff around and he's trying to figure out what to do next. And to God, it was very clear. He'd given Moses a mind. He had reason. He had intelligence. And he couldn't figure out. He knows that he's got the bones of Joseph with him. And the whole point is because they're going to the promised land that had been promised to Abraham and his seed. He has the children of Abraham with him. The promised land is the Canaan land. That's where they have to go. And so it should be obvious to Moses, hello, the promised land's on the other side of the Red Sea. Take him through the sea. That's the way it's, it's kind of implied to him. God says to Moses, kind of annoyed, he says, why are you crying out to me? Don't you get it? Take him through the Red Sea. Go through it by faith. And so Moses, you know, everybody up to that moment in time is expecting like a plague or something, all the, you know, Egyptians to get hit by lightning or to, you know, suddenly fall dead, you know, the oxygen is taken out of the air or something like that. You know, Moses is waving his his staff at, at the, you know, Egyptians coming at him and nothing's happening, right? Because he's not doing the right uh, act. This time it's not vipers. This time it's not lightning. This time it's not the sea turning to blood. And he turns... He doesn't worry about the Egyptian. He turns to the sea that's blocking them, not from their escape, but from the intended direction God wanted them to go all along. They have to go to Canaan land, to the land of promise. That was where God had intended them to go for 500 years five, the number of grace. He turns to the Red Sea, this huge blockage, waves his staff in the air, 
and the sea parts before them, and then the whole nation of Israel, which is backed up. I mean, you can imagine all the people see this, this group coming at them, and they're getting in tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. You know, there's no escape here. There's no escape there. They just keep moving tighter and tighter. And then the sea opens up, and the water piles up like mountains on either side, gets higher and higher. But the people pass through on dry ground. And they walk right through this open sea because there was nowhere else to go. They were pushed through, you know, coerced through whatever, but they get moving. And in the scriptural account, as they get to the other side, the Egyptians are still closing on them. The Egyptians got sucked in. They thought, even the Israelites thought, that the sea was their doom. It was their gloom. It was the very thing that was the um, path to their freedom. And so as the last Israelite gets through the Red Sea, as the Egyptians are closing in on them, the interesting thing is that this light armor, these chariots, they're heavier and their wheels are thin. And as they're going through this seabed floor, while it's dry right on the top, that weight goes down in and the mud starts to cake up and then it, the chariots don't wanna go straight and they go askew. And at the last bit, the chariots are like turning, the horses can't pull them through because they're bogging down in the seabed. And they're slowing down as they get closer while we're waiting for the last of the women and children to get through on the other side. And as the last one steps above the waterline, God removes the block, removes the walls that held those angels' hands that held the sea back. And the sea, which had piled up like mountains in height, suddenly collapsed down on the Egyptians, drowning them all. And in the record, uh, in some of the records, recordings, it's said that Pharaoh himself, in those last moments, leading the chariots nearly to where they got to the Israelites, at the last moment realized he wasn't going to make it, saw the waters collapsing, and declared, the God of Israel is the true God. And because he made that pronouncement, even at the edge of death, his bones were preserved. His body was found in that aftermath. And then his body was taken back to Egypt, mummified, and kept as a um, uh, marker through history that uh, he himself had found that God was, in fact, the true God and uh, declared that even in those last moments there in, in the collapse of the Red Sea. And from that point on, of course, the Israelite nation saved through water, just like Moses was, just like Noah was, just like is symbolic in the baptism uh, in the New Testament. Um, and the people go on to do all the rest of the things they do. Uh, there was complaining and mourning and, you know, bizarreness. The people were dying off because they, you can take the people out of Egypt. Right. But you can't take the Egypt out of people sometimes. And only uh, uh, those that could, could have that uh, taken out of them were allowed to go into the promised land. Right. And uh, uh, that was this rest of the story that we'll tell some other time. Yeah. I like the part of the story where they were wandering out for 40 years while they tried to figure out a system of jurisprudence and a system of law that was not wholly dependent on a system of slavery. After they'd just come out of slavery, how, what were they going to invent to replace it that would uh, be a system of justice for the people? That That's my favorite part of the whole five five books of Moses is what, how the way they tried to create something new. And of course they were unable to do it, but the, the whole story, it continues on that, that they, you know, the story still continues to this day. How do we do it? Well, we you know, the, 
the one thing you mentioned, and I think it's uh, very relevant to Jethro, you know, Moses uh, was having to preside over as judge all these disputes of the people. So somebody would have an argument with mm-hmm. so-and-so, they didn't see agree on something. They'd come to jo- uh, to Moses, you know, you have to decide this, you have to decide that. They were wearing him out. And Jethro, at one point, comes to Moses and uh, thank goodness for good fathers-in-law. If you get the chance to get mm-hmm. one, uh, you're really blessed. And uh, so here's this uh, Jethro uh, who's just a tribesman. He, he, he has sheep that he raised. Uh, you know, when, when Moses went into exile uh, in North Africa, he became a sheep herder of all things. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's got his wife and kids, you know, he's, he's out there living in a, a tribal existence. He goes from Pharaoh's court, the most extravagant type of living that existed on the planet at the day with everything, every service, every, you know, blessing bestowed on you. Uh, the most modern city on the planet. And he's a ruler in Egypt. And he goes from there to exile to being a sheep herder. He spent his first 40 years in Egypt and his second 40 years as a sheep herder in North Africa. And and by the way, the 40... But except for Jethro and his daughter that Moses married, that that was a ruling class family over there too. And they in, were that, priests, in that realm, and yes. she was a priestess and so that was like he went from one pharaoh's court to another. And you know? got all the training. And it was a different it was a different type of experience, but right. royalty of a different yeah. sort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One thousand percent. And but crazy? the beauty it, it is, and the beauty of Jethro is here he is out in the Sinai when Pharaoh took the children of Israel and uh, goes out into the Sinai, does this leaving Egypt and everything else. He has his family with him. Right. And his own family, including his father-in-law and other relatives. Right. And so his father-in-law pulls him aside and says, um, listen, uh, Moses, you're being worn out. You're becoming yeah. frazzled from having to judge between every single dispute of the people. What you need to do is have one representative from each of the 12 families, the 12 tribes, you know, the 12 children of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Um, One representative of each family, they judge within their own family everything. And then if there's a matter that can't... Right, they're the basis for representative government, right? That's right. That's right. And then if if they can't solve it there... Then they bring it to you. So they reduced the workload for Moses to a fraction of what it had been before. And they got to make the case, kind of the Supreme Court, if you will. But Israel's, God's design for Israel wasn't to be ruled by a king. When Israel brought Saul uh, into power and then later David, it wasn't. God's plan to have a king or a cane over Israel. The people cried out for a cane over them like all the other nations. That wasn't God's plan. God's plan was a representative government of judges. And they left God's plan. That's how it was in the temple, you know. Which they say that the temple was like a pretty uh, representative government and pretty representational, you know, like kind of like the United States in its purest form of our, our purest form of government before it all got effed up, you know, by. Well, we got, we got a hybrid. We got a hybrid of these things. We got a Pharaoh and a representative Mm -hmm. situation uh, with judges deciding between them. And uh, it's boy, we got some bad. We got some bad. Speaking of the reality of today, we have some very bad judges and a bad. It's just not working. Our 
our whole judicial system is just not working. So I figure like Red October, that that's uh, scary about our judicial system making these mandates that people are going to have to obey, I guess, uh, that are just, they're not even constitutional, but I guess they're going to uh, enforce them or something. It's also scary. What scary time. He didn't want a king or a cane over his people. He wanted a uh, judges to preside over the people. And uh, so we've lost our way or there was a losing of the way there. Um, yes, and of course, they, Moses. Yeah. Well, how, Moses, did we, how did we lose our way as horribly as we've lost it? How did we well, get here? Uh, you know, we, you know, we're in an imperfect world. Uh, the people that put together our form of government, uh, at the end of the day, there's this constitution, which is yeah. the contract between the people and its government uh, to control government, uh, where the people control the government, not the government controlling the people. And what's happened in our current age right now is that the government has gotten out of step and the people in power have made it a captured operation to yeah. do their will from a globalist perspective, not the will of the people, but the will of those who have captured control of the government. And so this moment we're in, this Red Sea moment, even right now, uh, if I was going to say what's the direction that America is about to go here in this Red October, we're backed up against the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, it's blocking us, but what's it blocking us? Is it blocking us to our demise where we now get mowed down by Pharaoh's chariots, by Pharaoh's mandates, by Pharaoh's rule? Do by we Pharaoh's get technology? Well, do we get mowed down like a chainsaw? Does, does it just come through our ranks or, uh, is this the moment you know, the interesting thing about Moses was he was really the commander in chief. He wasn't Pharaoh. He had been in Pharaoh's court. He was raised to be a Pharaoh, but the Pharaoh that was chasing them down was raised side by side with Moses. They were both raised in Pharaoh's court. They both knew the magician's trick. That's why when, when Moses uh, when when Pharaoh's advisors threw down their staves and they became mm -hmm. snakes, that was magic. That was illusion. When Moses saw the trick, he'd been raised in the court, but he took it to the next level. He threw down his staff and his snake ate all the other snakes of Pharaoh's advisors. And so they didn't have a staff. A staff was considered a symbol of rule. And so if you had a staff and it was marked correctly, if you waved your staff walking around Egypt, everybody knew, oh, my gosh, it'd be like a um, uh, uh, symbol of rank on your uniform. And you got instant respect because of your staff. When Pharaoh had his advisors throw down their staffs uh, and they became snakes and, and Moses's staff became a snake also and ate all the other snakes, it ate their symbols of power. It was like pulling the stripes off of uh, your command uh, right. there right in front of them. It was like breaking the sword on, on the deck of the Missouri and embarrassed them all. And they didn't have their sign of power and, and uh, position. And so uh, Moses is out there at the edge of the sea and the people are screaming at him like he's brought them there to be killed. And uh, once he understands what he's supposed to do, once his mind clears, God says to him, why are you crying out to me? You're here at the mm -hmm. edge of the Red Sea. The promised land's over there. The obstacle for you isn't the Egyptians. It's the sea. Command the sea to part. Command this mountain out of the way. And the sea becomes mountains to either sides. They pass through the center of this mountain of sea. And then it collapses in on the Egyptians. The very thing that's intended for us right now here in America, this Red Sea moment with the collapse of the economy, with the collapse of the stock market, with the loss of your future uh, retirement savings, with um, 
uh, an economic crisis with inflation going to the moon, with red China threatening war over Taiwan and uh, every kind of, of disaster, all the gauges moving into the red zone. This moment isn't actually, it might look to the president, to the Pharaoh, like they've got us cornered and they're going to take us all out and we're all going to, you know, expire here shortly in this chainsaw of, of, of shots. It might look that way. But the reality is this is not our annihilation moment. God, through Moses, told the people, all those people chasing you down right now on those chariots, not one of them will you ever see again after this day? And then Moses turns to the sea, raises his staff, it parts, they pass through it, the sea collapses in on them, and all of them die. And this moment for America is that kind of a moment. You're going to see that the very thing that was the obstacle, it collapses on them. We move forward. We're supposed to survive this. You were made for this day. This event, the people that are listening to you, Roseanne, are here for a reason. The people that are part of this conversation right now, the word to them is, don't, don't be screaming and crying and moaning against Moses. It was God that brought us here. God that made us come to this moment at the edge of this Red Sea for this exact time you were created to go take the possession. There's a bright day ahead. There's, there's all sorts of things. There's going to be Nuremberg type trials for those people that tried to destroy us as a nation with this concocted moment. But it's like, uh, it's like a Jubilee moment. Uh, when Israel uh, in 1917, the land was set aside for Israel in the 1917 Balfour Declaration between uh, Lord Rothschild and, and Balfour uh, setting the land aside to, to buy up the land. 1967, 50 years later, the Jubilee year, mm -hmm. Jerusalem was returned to the people in the 67 uh, Six Day right. War. This is the same thing here for America. We're in this war that was thrust upon us. We didn't ask for it. We didn't look for it. But we won't shirk away from it. We're going to have this engagement. Was it entertaining? But the way we're going to have it is by God. We're going through the Red Sea. And we're going to live. And we're going to see another day. Those that are pursuing us will not. That's this Red Sea moment. Well, it that seems makes... that way because I... I was thinking about the Purim boomerang thing and about how 2016, after that election, boy, they kept on saying that uh, Trump had colluded with Russia and blah, blah. He needed to get uh, impeached and everybody who helped him collude with Russia to steal the election, they needed to be arrested and they even arrested a few. You remember that? Oh, absolutely. And now the boomerang is... I, I love using that term, by the way. I, I got that from you. <laughs> the boomerang is all those people that intended to take out uh, uh, Trump, uh, you know, all of their machinations, all their alliances, which were China-sided, are right. about to be exposed and are being exposed. They will fall into the pit that they dug. Um, That's right. That's exactly what it seems like. The pit they dug for Trump saying he stole an election with Russia with, what, $1,500 in Facebook ads. They brought Facebook into it saying they yeah. stole the election with Russia, Facebook. And uh, they dug that pit for Trump. Yep. He tried to, you know, and they did arrest people. Roger yep. Stone being one of them and other people. And, and they did try to... Uh, impeach him and they did uh you know all of that, all stuff. that stuff and now look look at the there's the gallows there and just seems like it and then i was reading hey it says Purim was the halloween of you know the Purim is the halloween of the you know Ju judaism oh i'm and so it, glad and you then raised it went, that 
Yeah, and then it went in my head. That's why I called you because it went ba bing, ba bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> and I went, oh, oh. Well, oh. okay. So, 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 Roseanne, when you said what? that, that was so cool because, of course, what's the whole deal? Uh, you know, we talked about this Esther moment, the boomerang, the flip. At the beginning of this season, Haman has hung on his own petard, right. dies out in excruciating agony, screaming on the device that he created for Mordecai and uh, as a prelude to the destruction of the Jews. Right. But the Purim day, the purge day, was still way off in the future. Right. And so uh, the actual combat, because at the time of, of, of the of the feast where Esther told the king that she was under a death sentence at the actual feast. Um, that's when Haman was killed. And then the king, after Haman was killed, talks with Mordecai and Esther, you know, what can I do to stop this? Because he's king. He can't reverse a ruling because he's considered to be infallible. So yeah, he he's Roman. People keep uh, hiding that, but he's Roman. Yeah, Roman, Persian, uh, uh, that extrapolation of those right. empires. Right. And so he can't, he can't reverse a ruling. What he does is he amends it. He adds right. to it. And he says, okay, the day is still on. Nothing's changed. I'm still king. Uh, but the Jews can also arm themselves and make alliances. Right. And so they spend the rest of that season, that year, preparing for the battle. They make alliances. Look, we do business together. We got fields together. We got kids together, whatever. Uh, let's be friends. If Haman's kids, his 10 sons are going to come for us, um, you know, we'll work together to defend ourselves. We have shared interests, joint interests, uh, can we come up with a contract to deal? And so one of the things that you've shared that I, I had not heard this before was that when Haman's 10 sons came to attack Israel on the Purim purge day, mm -hmm. that in the telling of the story, uh, when uh, in Jewish households, they go through this per a moment every year. It's said that Haman's 10 sons all died in the same breath on the right. Purim day. And right. that, that, that Purim day is this Halloween day. Uh, in, in the, in the Catholic uh, church, uh, all saints day is November 1st. Mm -hmm. All souls day is November 2nd. And on the numbers, those are, are also relevant because 11 is the number of war. It's the number of right. discord. Um, uh, and so uh, 111 or 11 1, 1, 1, 1 is this uh, war number. And then uh, uh, 11 2 or 2 times 11, 22, there's all sorts of symbology involved in that. And that's the split. And in El, in El Souls Day, that's the day when the divide comes. Those souls are sent to hell or to heaven, depending on their actions all through this life. That's the judgment day, if you will. Um, in the occult, at eleven three, yes. Uh, in the law of war is the day when the sovereign power gets to kick out the occupying power, and it's also my birthday. <laughs> Which is really cool because I said last year, everybody wants to know what to give me for my birthday. And I said, I think you know what to give me on election day. And so <laughs> then I was bummed out that uh, they prevented me from having my birthday present. But I think I'm still going to get it a little bit later, just like Esther did, you know. That's exactly, boy, that is that is so right. I forgot about that part of our conversation, but that's true. Um, uh, by the way, uh, this, this uh, in the occult, 
the way that they prepare victims for sacrifice is by terrorizing them, by adrenalizing them because they yeah. drink the blood. And so they adrenalize them and then it makes the blood give them certain effects like a drug, a high. And uh, so they take days doing that. Yeah. Um, in this reversal, in this boomerang, watch what happens and think about that as these people who've been terrorizing the country, terrorizing the world by their actions, um, that which they dug for everyone else turns back on them and the timing and the days. Uh, there was going to be some symbology there. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, that 11-3, when was the reversal on that? 311. Stand by, enjoy the show. What you'll learn down the road is going to be amazing. Thank you so much for this conversation. Boy, it was about 10 levels deep. I, I loved it, of course. I love all those levels. And, well, uh, thinking, thinking, I, I was going to start out with a prayer to, because uh, I feel like, well, we need to start doing that to ask God's protection from the enemy when we start talking and when all through the, when we start sharing uh, ideas about, you know, God and, and the good stuff, we, we got to ask for protection. But I felt it all through this convo and it was, it was wonderful to talk with you and a lot of, a lot of good, a lot of good info there. When we were talking about the Red Sea and the splitting of the Red Sea, I, I was saying that some people, I've heard them talk about splitting of the Red Sea actually being the human blood and the splitting of the Red Sea being uh, coming back to be about um, herd immunity or coming to that, you know, the blood doing its uh, job that it's supposed to do before uh, bad stuff is entered into it. You know, a, a healing Mm hmm. Coming. Well, again, uh, there's this baptism, uh, you know, passing through uh, what is symbolic of death with the water. You know, the symbology going back to Noah and the flood and even the pre Adamic period uh, where there was a flood before Adam where there was civilization yeah. on earth, but they were the pre-Adamites, uh, Adamites, uh, some prior civilization. Um, and uh, that's where we go into this uh, Plato's discourses about that era. And of course, that's the um, uh, stuff that's, it's harder conversation to get into, but it's very interesting that when God gave the uh, rainbow, it was, because there had been cloud or or a dew cover over the whole earth. There wasn't weather right. patterns like we have today. And the earth was watered by a mist That's that came right. up morning and evening. The dew. But yeah. The dew. And then after the flood, you had a weather pattern with clouds. And that's when the rainbow was brought in. And then God promised he would never again destroy the earth by water. Uh, purge the earth or whatever. And it was a promise, not just to uh, mankind, not just to Noah, but to all living things. God made yeah. the promise to all living things that he would never destroy the earth by flood again. And uh, so, you know, but we, there's this passing through the water that is symbolic of um, through, you know, the hands of death. Uh, and right. surviving that's this Red Sea thing. That's what we're coming to for America. We're right up against the Red Sea, but everything they had planned against us, everything in this moment that was intended for our destruction is in fact going to boomerang to be a reversal, to be a flip, and will come on those who intended ill against God's people. And we as God's people, as this nation, under some divine hand, uh, even if our detractors don't see it and don't understand it and think that they can get a hold of us, those of us that 
are looking to God for our salvation, who uh, understand our heritage as a people, the pilgrims that came here to seek a place where they could worship God freely uh, and not be under the hand of these uh, blood uh, right to rule um, uh, Canaanites. Uh, they might not believe that we're still here. God's about to show them. And I believe after this, this I death see. angel that's hovering over America and over the world with um, the fallout from this shot and the damage from this shot, that new technologies, technologies that actually already exist, yeah. will be allowed to come to the fore come to fruition to help with the repair of the heart muscles, yeah, repair of the lung muscles, repair absolutely. and dissolving of the clots that were intended right. against his people, that there is going to be an amazing revival in America and a turning towards God in the aftermath of this Jubilee year, which ends next March. Yes. And we will regain control in the country the end won't be for everyone. There's, there's losses along the way, uh, and it's horrible. But those of us that keep our eyes on God, stay pure, including in the blood, um, will be part of the revolution, the, the pushback against those who would bring us back into slavery or keep us in slavery, yeah. uh, to free our country, to worship God, to be his servants and make this place the promised land. That's right. It was always intended to be. You know, That's Reagan right. in in to his love speech, each other, free to it, free to free of fear, so that we can love each other. Well, Reagan in his speech, um, uh, a time for choosing, which was really the beginning of his political career, 1964, amazing speech. He talked about the Cuban who had come here to escape communism and Castro. And there was a conversation happening and people were talking about the communization of America, mm -hmm. this red tide that was taking over America back yeah. in that era. And the Cuban turns to the others and he says, but you don't understand. When I came here from Cuba, at least I had some place to go yeah. to escape communism, to escape the slavery of that communistic rule. If America falls, where can we go? And that's why we as a people have to push back, stand. When we get to the other side of the sea, all this that was intended against us, Nuremberg trials against those who tried to take us out. We will survive this. We will move forward. We will be the shining light to the world. We will do what God intended us to do. Even if it's, you know, the road is not going to be easy even after this Jubilee year. We have work to do. But we will survive this. God, please, in your heaven, hear our prayer. And, and with that, Roseanne, let's say a prayer together. Uh, and uh, uh, before we end, Father God, we thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for your protections. We thank you for your fire by night, your cloud of pillar by day to protect us. We ask you for divine guidance in the path ahead to understand how to proceed forward, to choose life over death, to choose justice over evil and to fulfill according to your command, your wishes, your directive, this, this direction for America to be prosperous, to be a light to the world, to proliferate, to have children and children and children and children and children that worship you and look to you and are a blessing to you and to the world. We ask you for protection in this exact moment and we ask you for guidance for our leader and leaders as we look not to our enemy and their destructive power, but to your blessing, the dividing of the sea, the dry ground, and the ability for us to pass through this crisis in one piece 
and survive to the other side and the destruction of those who sought evil against us. I thank you for Roseanne and for her friendship and for her insights. And I ask you to bless her and give her long, long life where we get many more of these conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, I want, uh, and I say amen. And for you, I think, I thank God for you too, as a good friend and a, a shining light that we all will look to. We look to you. And uh, thank you for your answers that you've given so many of us. We look to you. Uh, I wanted to say about the Purim thing. Uh, here you go, uh, cut to right after the Nuremberg laws that you, you talked about. When they hung 10, you know, when they killed, they killed Haman's 10 sons, cut to Nuremberg, uh, 10 Nazis were hung. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Ju and uh, Julius Stryker uh, was one of them, and as he as he approached his death, it's in the papers, and you can Google it. Nobody believes it, but it is. You can Google it. He he yelled out, "Purim Fest, 1948." So wow. I don't have any doubt that God is it, it is here, is in control, and will again, bring us a Purim Fest for America, because this is uh, the place where people fled to, and it's still the place where people flee to, and it, and it must remain. And, and the government of, by, and for the people must remain. So amen to all that, and thank you. And uh, Shabbat Shalom tonight. It's a big, it's a big, big one. But anyway, I don't know when this will air, but it was a, it was a good one. <laughs> do it again. We'll do it again. Roseanne, I love you. Yeah, and too, I'm looking thanks. forward, uh, you know, you've got uh, the travel restrictions that make it so hard to, to get yeah. over there and have one of the people. In fact, nobody knows this, but by the time this is out, it probably will be public knowledge. We have a oh, airing yeah. date. Oh, uh, yes. The so sound great. of freedom, and that's going to be God. public. And then the other thing, by the way, too. Are you going to give has, it out or what? You're not I'm not going to give it out. Well, okay, I'll let but, that be made public, but it's, it's, uh, okay. it's, it is in February. And then the other that's thing so is. Great. Uh, people need if, to see that movie. It's going to like blow everybody's minds and talk about people finally getting the truth and crossing over to the other side. I can't yeah. wait till people see it because it's part of. It's part of uh, splitting the consciousness open that allows us to get to the other side. Well, it's 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 coming at a very precise date yeah. that is um, intended to be there as a lot of these revelations are coming forward. And so I think it's very important now that we have a release date, general release uh, for the Sound of Freedom. But by the way, anybody that says you can buy the movie online, or whatever, that's that's a scam going on. You can see the trailer. There's no movie for sale online. Don't act like you can give a credit card and do that. That's it's been out of be there. It's going to be real movie theaters, right? Real movie theaters, yes. It's going to oh, be boy, very widely time. released. Uh, um, large, large number of movie theaters. I think it's going to be yeah. the biggest movie in history. But uh, Oh, we'll my see. God, I would love that. that we'll have yep. to put our mind to making that happen. That's cool. We'll yeah, see and we'll, we'll work more on that when we get closer. Okay. The other thing is um, there's uh, an event in Las Vegas and I know you don't really want to travel. I wish you could be there because it's going to be the one to remember people for a very long time after this. are going to be, oh, my gosh, I had to be there. I can't believe it. I wish I'd been there. Don't be on the outside. Uh, the Patriot Double Down in Las Vegas on um, October 22nd through 25th. Uh, it's actually year? 23rd to 25th. Yeah, this year, just a couple weeks away now. If you got the yeah. chance to be there, you better be there because it'll be the one what everybody's going, oh, my gosh. I can't tell you everything, but there's oh. announcements to come. Probably by the time this is out, uh, one of them will be public, but uh, I can't say anything prematurely. But they have guests that are going to be there that are going to really knock your socks off. So if you get the chance to get pockets before they're all gone, and be at the Patriot Double Down. And then uh, some of that will be live streamed over at uh, 107 Daily. So uh, yeah. anyway, just, just an aside. 
uh, if, if people are close enough by, they can get to it. They better get to it. But uh, the, there's only so many tickets, and then they're done. It's not a huge event, but it will be the one to, to remember uh, yeah. post everything that's coming. So anyway, Roseanne, love you. Look too. forward to talking again. Let's do this more often. Yeah, and, love it. Uh, uh, I just appreciate you coming on and, and doing this together. Yeah, can't wait to show it. All right. All right. Talk soon. Adios, pal. <laughs> uh, see ya. All right. Bye. Bye.